Good morning, and welcome to the 15th German Symposium hosted by the German Society of the LSE. My name is Nara Benz, I'm this year's president of the society, and I'm very happy to welcome you all here this morning. Before we start with the symposium with our first two speakers, German ambassador to the UK, Dr. Peter Ammann, and mayor of Hamburg, Mr. Olaf Scholz, I would like to share with you a short story about the origin of this year's guiding question. Nine months ago, Pamina, Stefan, and I took over the executive board of the society, and we faced the challenge to come up with a guiding question. But how do we generate a guiding question? Well, the idea of the symposium is to promote an intercultural exchange by raising interest in German politics, business, and culture. So we asked our students, we went to the pub with some friends of ours, friends from different countries, different universities, and we asked them the questions they had about Germany, what they wanted to know about Germany. Well, do not underestimate Germans. I mean, uh, do not ask you underestimate students. We were confronted with serious questions like, uh, well, why do German people think it's OK to wear white socks and sandals? I mean, <laughs> we, we had no answer to that. But tomorrow, Django Azur, he might give us some answers to these questions when he um, touches upon the question whether Germany is too strange for Europe. But finally, one of our students, an I IR student, asked the question whether Germany is just too big for Europe or too small for the world. This is the exact same question that Henry Kissinger, former US Secretary of State, asked before. Poor old Germany, too big for Europe, too small for the world. I'm not here today to provide you with an answer to that question. However, I'm proud to present to you a week of illuminating and challenging speeches and discussions. Our 40 speakers will cover perspectives on the refugee crisis, managing Europe, views on the Brexit, as well as impacts of innovation and digitization on German people and German business. These discussions will hopefully help you form your own view on the guiding question and give you a better idea of Germany's role in the global arena. Before I hand over to Ambassador Ammon, I would like to thank everyone in the German Society Committee for your incredible work which made this year's symposium possible in the first place. I would also like to express my gratitude for the support of the German Embassy and all to all our sponsors, especially Credit Suisse. Finally, I'm pleased to introduce Ambassador Ammann, who will open this year's symposium. Before coming to London, he was the ambassador to the United States of America and to France, as well as the State Secretary of the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin. Please welcome Ambassador Ammann. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to open again the, this year's German Symposium at the LSE. And I'm glad to say that over the years, this symposium has developed a reputation far beyond the confines of academia and far beyond the British Isles. This is a sign of persistent quality, organizational skill, and of course, the ability to attract prominent speakers who are willing to address the issues of the day. So if I may, I would like to make two short remarks. One, by way of introduction of the speaker, who is to take the floor after me, the first mayor and president of the Senate of the free and Hanseatic city of Hamburg, Olaf Scholz. In a second remark, I would like to briefly set the scene for our discussions by touching on the fundamental challenges the UK and Germany are facing together these days. Let me start by stating the obvious. Olaf Scholz is one of the most influential political figures in Germany, not only because he's head of government of one of 16 federal states. The way we organize our, sorry, as a former federal minister for social affairs, he is also known and respected as a creative thinker, exploring new solutions to challenges to our social system. You may recall that in the negotiations on the new settlement for the UK in the EU, the question of in-work benefits for EU workers was one of the big contentious issues. And the way we organize our social system in future has huge consequences, not only for our economies, but as we learned now in these negotiations with the Brits, also for the cohesion of the European Union and our societies in general. 
Looking ahead in time, we can expect our social systems to remain under strain on many counts. We have aging societies. We have the effects of mass migration. Or we have the consequences of near zero interest rates, to name just a few. So I think we can expect an interesting debate here. On. But before I pass the floor to Olaf Scholz, I wish to remind you all that in, the la in less than four months' time, the people of the UK, of this country here, will take a momentous decision, which will greatly affect the future, not only of Britain, but of, of us all. I want to state here that I sincerely hope that the UK will opt to stay inside the EU on June 23rd, when this referendum is taking place. And there are many reasons. Clearly, the world has become more dangerous every day, with civil and religious wars spreading in the Middle East and parts of North Africa. We discover that globalization has a new face. Migration has become global with 60 million people worldwide on the move. So we have not, uh, we are talking about 1.1 million who came to Germany last year, but altogether in the world, there are 60 million on the move. Another aspect of globalization of today, in today's world, is the globalization of terror. So we see terror attacks not only in the countries un in under civil war, but we see them in Paris, in, uh, in California, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so this is another uh, phase of globalization today. And finally, we see uh, probably as a result to all this, the, res the rise of populism in practically all Western countries, from Donald Trump to uh, uh, populist groups in East Eastern Europe. So my conclusion of all this analysis is that with the global dimension of the challenge, we will need more Europe, not less. So I, I would like to conclude by borrowing a slogan from another campaign, the Scottish campaign here, which was uh, making headlines in Britain last year, and tell my Brit British friends that the people of Europe too will be much better together. Only as a union of more than 500 million people with the largest single market on the planet will we be able to defend our values and our interests in a globalized world. The economic sanctions, for example, that made Tehran give up its nuclear weapons program would have been an, a blunt and ineffective instrument had we not coordinated our efforts as Europeans. Similarly, the sanctions that brought Mr. Putin to the Minsk conference table had their impact only because we acted together as Europe, not as a single nation. Of course, Europe is work in progress. We cannot stand still and be content with what we have achieved so far. The European institutions need constant reform and adjustment. But I believe that the UK should accept the offer to be part of that process, play an active role in shaping the future of the EU, and not withdraw into splendid in insulation. The, rom the rom romantic dream of restored sovereignty, which you hear occasionally in this country, would turn out to be a pipe dream. Because in a world of globalized political decision making, as well as of globalized production chains and globalized financial markets, it would mean less power for Britain over this country's fate, not more. So I think we need a constant dialogue among the best minds from Germany and the UK on how to optimize our decision-making structures and European institutions. That's why we are here today. And I think we have to think ahead, in particular together with the younger generation, whose future is at stake now. As I said, that's why we're here today, and it gives me great pleasure to hand over the floor to the city of Hamburg's first mayor, Olaf Scholz. Thank you. Excellency, Mrs. Spence, Mrs. Carl, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you for the kind invitation. I'm very pleased to be here today. The London School of Economics and Political Science is an ideal place for me as a citizen of Hamburg to speak about Europe. What allows me for a few moments to follow in the footsteps of a great European from Hamburg whom all of you know. I'm referring, of course, to Lord Ralph Dahndorf, the Hamburg-born longtime director of the LSE. As a politician and a scholar, Lord Dahndorf supported and encouraged European unification. He continually stressed, stressed that the quintessence of Europeanness, in the empathetic sense, lies not in a mechanical leveling, but rather in the judicious combination of universal solutions and national particularities. Thus he wrote, for example, a European Europe is also a much differentiated, colorful, and multiple Europe. It is also a Europe in which those matters are dealt with and regulated in common, which could perhaps only sensibly be dealt with in this way. Lord Dandorf looked at Europe as both, a German and a British. For him it was as natural to use both perspectives as to possess both passports. This is worth emphasizing as it serves at the point of departure for these remarks. There is a long and extremely varied British-German tradition. Within it stand the centuries-long ties with the London Steelyard, which for the first time connected the kingdom to a very successful European commercial and econo economic community, namely the Hanseatic League. Likewise successful and culturally influential was the House of Hanover, which from 1714 to 1837 reigned in both Great Britain and Germany. However, in the early 20th century, German intransigence and hunger for status, as well as the two world wars that it started, brought enormous disruption. We understand that the citizens of the United Kingdom look at Germany and think about how it was the British who freed Europe from the Nazis. Precisely in northern Germany, and especially in Hamburg, we know <coughs> that we have to thank the British for the establishment of our democratic institutions. Every day, the news program Tagesschau, one of the most important sources of information in the Federal Republic, is broadcast from a studio on Huge Green Week. Huge Green was a British journalist who, after the war, helped to set up the ARD public broadcaster that is still highly renowned today. Many citizens, scholars, and statesmen have worked to normalize British-German relations. Today our common goal is a Europe of democracy, peace, and prosperity. Strengthening the ties between Britain and Germany is an ongoing effort. We are counting on people like you, ladies and gentlemen, who know the perspectives of both countries. You live these ties and can carry them forward. You will enrich Europe. Your education at this excellent and world-famous university is your capital. You will assume responsibilities, shape politics, and make decisions. And I implore you to do so in the spirit of Europe. Bring our nations together, strengthen our democratic institutions, and show everyone how enormously productive a British-German perspective is. Among the notable events in post-war British-German cultural history was the launching of the career of the Beatles in Hamburg in 1960. <laughs> Hamburgers were enthralled by the group, whose lineup then still included Stuart Sutcliffe and Pete Best. But after about 503 hours, the party was over. Over a formality, the police expelled the Beatles from the country. John Lennon worked a few jokes about this in his into his biography, but fortunately no one holds it against us. <laughs> Hamburg gave the Beatles their start. They returned to Liverpool with a new hairstyle and international performance experience and went on to achieve global fame. <laughs> Today, no Britain would be expe expelled from Hamburg, at least not over a formality. <laughs> Nor would any other EU citizen who was working here. On the contrary, the EU encourages the mobility of young people undergoing vocational training, studying and developing their talents. Indeed, the freedom of movement of European citizens is one of the cornerstones of the EU. 
In the early years, freedom of movement applied exclusively to economic activity. It was, so to speak, the personal slash human corollary to the common market. With the introduction of European citizenship, however, the core of individual rights was emancipated from the market. Freedom of movement is now foremost among the European civil rights, being extended to 500 million EU citizens. And it is a vibrant right. Pensioners spend their golden years exploring every last corner of Europe. Young people ask the languages of their young, pe young people speak the languages of their neighboring countries, and everyone here at the LSE knows of the enormous potential for enrichment that mobility and education possesses. However, at the heart of mobility are the economic related fundamental liberties freedom to work and engage in trade within the framework of the internal market. Citizens can choose the place in Europe where they want to earn their livelihood. They can go where they see an opportunity for themselves. They work under the same conditions as native citizens and must receive equal pay. The Beatles would no longer be thrown out, discrimination is prohibited. Freedom of movement is the European right to equality of opportunity on the labor market. Freedom of movement for workers is also an important economic factor. Businesses profit enormously from skilled workers from other countries. Many appreciate having bilingual, uh, bilingual uh, employees. Entire economic sectors, such as the health system, <coughs> logistics, and hospitality could scarcely function without employees from other member states. In this immigration, immigration speech, British Prime Minister David Cameron also explicitly stressed that the greatness of a nation depends on its openness to foreign professionals. Until now, the exercise of freedom of movement has not led to any disruptions, even in times of economic crisis. Citizens from Ireland, Spain, Italy, and Greece have settled in other EU countries many of them later returning to their homelands when job opportunities there improve. With the expansion into Central and Eastern Europe, the number of job seekers on the move has increased dramatically. Europe now has a workforce of some 200 million men and women, of whom all could potentially set off with the families and try their luck in another country. It is now evident that the EU is insufficiently prepared, both legally and politically, for such a mass exercise of this right. It is the big cities of Europe that are most directly affected. Metropolitan areas such as <coughs> Greater London or <coughs> Hamburg attract thousands of labor migrants. For many Europeans, they are places of hope for a better life. And it is not only the best and the brightest, Priced skilled workers and problem, problem solvers, those whom the American economist Richard Florida has dubbed the creative class that come. There are also the unemployed and families in need of support. Precisely for unskilled workers, there are too few or only low paid jobs. The British Prime Minister also made clear that the United Kingdom no longer wishes to extend full benefits to EU foreigners. Denmark, Sweden, and Germany, there are also fears that more people exercising freedom of movement could burden the welfare state. The causes for this can be seen by way of a comparison with the United States. There, with a population of more than 300 million, the principle of labor migration works considerably better. Many careers are spread out over multiple states. Indeed, it is common when changing jobs to switch states as well. The states are varyingly attractive with enormous differences in pros prosperity. However, this also begs, begs comparison with Europe. Massachusetts and Mississippi are as different as Sweden and Greece. However, in the US, labor migration is unproblematic as there are fewer and less precisely defined state benefits to be had. And above all, in the US, there are uniform rules governing access to welfare. While differences exist 
among the various states, the key decisions are made centrally by the federal government in Washington. The EU, in contrast, currently has 28 separate social welfare systems. Neither historically nor conceptually can one speak of a European welfare state. Every member state provides a different density of coverage, defines different requirements for receipt of benefits, and sets different goals. Basic income, health insurance, and jobless benefits are more generous in some countries than others. Even a superficial comparison highlights the danger that better social benefits might function as false incentives. No welfare state can afford this in the long term. It is common sense that needy native citizens should receive support. In Europe, the principle of solidarity can only work if we define it with the whole of Europe in mind. It is important for the Union's cohesion that it be clear when and why citizens of other member states are entitled to receive social benefits. We need an adaptable concept of solidarity. There are few who would favor an American solution to the problem. Notions of a uniform European welfare state founder not least on the rocks of differing financial models. In Germany, for example, the healthcare system is largely funded through insurance premiums, whereas in Britain it is financed through taxes. Thus, social benefits do not belong to the canon of European policies, but rather follow the principle of subsidiarity. Authority lies with the nation states. But what does this mean for EU citizens who move to other member states? Prime Minister Cameron has taken a clear position on this and demanded a redefinition of the UK's relationship to the EU. This includes the demand that workers from other member states may only be able to claim in-work benefits after a waiting period of four years. Fortunately, it was possible to reach a compromise. The EU heads of state and government passed a resolution in Brussels that is to come into effect in the event of a positive outcome of the UK referendum. It includes the introduction into the provision of workers' freedom of movement of a protective mechanism, the so-called emergency break. It expressly states that the protective mechanism will act as a solution to the United Kingdom's concerns about the exceptional inflow of workers from elsewhere in the European Union that has seen over, has seen over the last years. This mechanism gives Britain the power to deny social benefits to EU citizens from other member states for a period of four years. The authorization would apply for a maximum period of seven. The provision will only be introduced if the island votes yes on remaining in the EU, and for the most part it will apply only to the United Kingdom. For the temporary protective mechanism can only be deployed in countries that did not make full use of the traditional periods of free movement of workers which were provided for in recent accessions X. Under those provisions, social benefits for EU foreigners could be limited to a for a period of up to seven years. The United Kingdom, as well as Sweden and Ireland, did not avail themselves of this possibility. The emergency break gives the government in London more room for money. Decisions relating to the disposal of national expenditures will be made in accordance with the wishes of the citizens. It is a means of leaving measures for the domestic labor market within the sovereignty of the nation state. This outcome was a compromise that demanded a great deal from all member states. But the Brussels compromise is a good one. It is a reasonable one. I very much hope that the citizens of the United Kingdom will also recognize this as a compromise in their favor and will vote on the 23rd of June to remain in the EU. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that the question of what social benefits EU foreigners are entitled to receive is being discussed in other states as well. The British protective mechanism will not provide a solution for them, as for most countries, it does not apply. 
we therefore need a set of rules for what we might refer to as the normal course of action. Legally speaking, it is a conceivable that 200, it is conceivable that 200 million workers might, together with their families, choose to exercise their freedom of movement. We are still far away from an event of this order of magnitude. However, if only five to 10% of the population should move to just a few states in search of work, with some failing to find it, it would currently cause problems. In addition, German authorities and courts in Germany are already having to decide whether EU citizens residing in Germany are entitled to receive basic security benefits. Does the German Social Security Code apply to EU foreigners? This is not a trivial question. The state of the law is still unclear. Does the largest social court in Germany, the one from Berlin, reach a different decision than the higher federal social court? Both are familiar with the comparable rulings of the European Court of Justice and yet have reached different interpretations. Such a degree of confusion is famously proud of. I would like to outline a suggestion for a solution to these questions. It is my opinion that we can find a solution to the problem that is both thorough and practical. The solution might, must satisfy four conditions. First, it should be generally seen as just and fair. Second, it should define the entitlement to requirements for EU citizens for benefits. Third, it should give national lawmakers freedom to shape social policy. And fourth, it should not curb freedom of movement. I believe that such a solution could be found if we understand it as a question of individual rights. This fits in well with existing legal systems. The right to freedom of movement belongs to the canon of civil rights. Thus, the regulation for social benefits should also be outlined within the framework of individual rights. This is possible when the concept of labor is placed at the center of our considerations. Labor is a good approach for thinking about justice. John Locke stated that what one has produced by the labor of his body and the work of his hands are properly his. This idea has spread all over Europe. It is embraced by conservatives and liberals alike. The principle is even found in the Marxist concept of exploitation, presumably also because Marx wrote Das Kapital in the British Museum. It is part of the European canon of values to say that work creates claims. Differentiation are justified when they are based on labor and achievement. Labor is furthermore the central term because it is about free movement for workers. Citizens can choose where they want to work in Europe. Freedom of movement is a general right. It applies to all, and it is also a negative right. It forbids discrimination against workers. With social benefits, it is a different story. They are specific, apply in particular situations, and are conditional upon different factors. In some cases, they are extended only to people who have paid into the system. In others, only to citizens and still others to those in need. Entitlement to financial benefits is thus tied to individually varying circumstances. My proposed position is that with regard to the issue of the free movement of workers, we must in the long term link social benefits to the question of labor. We must focus on labor in order to prevent freedom of movement which is an aspect of equality of opportunity from turning into a force that decouples labor from financial benefits. In the long term, it therefore strikes me as sensible to link the social benefits that the EU citizens receive outside of their countries of origin with the work they have performed. Their claim to support in the country to which they have immigrated arises only when they have worked full time for a year receiving at least the minimum wage. In Germany, that would correspond to an income of 1,470 euros per month. With this solution, 
Social welfare benefits will be linked to the ability to integrate into the labor market without limiting freedom of movement. It sends out a clear message. You can look for work anywhere. However, you do not have the right to choose the country in which you wish to receive social benefits. Support is due to those who have contributed to the national product. This, this solution honors the contributions of immigrants and also serves as an incentive to earn one's living through labor. So much for my suggestion for further developments. I have allowed myself to look a short distance into the future. Of much greater importance are the current developments. You know that there is a strong argument for agreeing to the Brussels Compromise and it is the United Kingdom. No one can replace the UK in the EU. This applies to foreign policy, security policy, and economic policy alike. The UK's strength is indispensable for an effective foreign and security policy in the EU. The EU is an amplifier. Together, we can give our concerns global political weight. Britain is a decisive factor from an economic perspective as well. The EU knows the importance of London as both a center of finance and trade and as the hub of the Commonwealth States. The European Union needs reforms. It must become more democratic and flexible and at the same time return some competencies to the regions. We want to set these reforms in motion together with our partners in the United Kingdom. Britain is an open society that can serve as a model for the rest of Europe. British body politic unites citizens from a panoply of countries and of various cultural and ethnic backgrounds into a stable parliamentary democracy. Europe could stand to become a great deal more British. Britain is the homeland of great European minds, the land of the new lingua franca and the model of statehood. The European Union would be small without Britain. We do not wish and indeed cannot do without Britain. We are banking on the courage, pragmatism, and willingness to compromise of the citizens of Britain. Germany is hoping for a yes vote in the part of the United Kingdom to remain in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> um, Mayor Olaf Scholz, Ambassador. I would like to open this discussion to the audience for another approximately 30 minutes. Would you please raise your hand and stand up if you have any questions and then address the question directly to one of the speakers, please. Results for the for Germany specifically if the UK is leaving the European Union. It's very difficult to say what will be the consequences for Germany or for all the other states in the, within the European Union, as it is very difficult to, s to speak about the consequences for the United Kingdom. I'm very sure that anyone will suffer from uh, a process like this, the United Kingdom as well as all the other states. And to my point of view, it's absolutely <coughs> clear. Uh, in the midst of this century, we will have uh, approximately 10 billion people living there. Many people say us that this will be the end of the increase of population on the Earth. But if you count this, it's just 500 million people living in Europe uh, and the rest of the world, 9.5 million billion people, uh, will have a <coughs> bigger influence than we are used to have as Europeans, if we look as, understand us as a group. On the other hand, we should also understand that some values which are important for us, like democracy, the, the rule of law, and things like that, um, are really much, very much <coughs> related to you. It is not the case that in any country we find similar situations. And so it is of biggest importance 
that we find a way how we can act together. So this will be, is the most important question of this. I think that anyone should understand that even a country with 80 million people and a big GDP <coughs> like, the, that, uh, like Germany will not have the political weight to influence world developments and no other country will be able to do so. But altogether we have a chance at sharing common values, values it should be possible. And uh, the other question is the economic consequences. I think they will be worse as anyone could imagine in any country of Europe, United Kingdom as well as in the others. Do you have, um, because after, after Cameron announced this deal, um, he, he was sort of like telling the people how there will never be a full integration of the UK into Europe, into e the EU. Do you think this is a definite statement? And do you think there's ad any potential or any opportunities to actually change that and actually fully integrate U the UK ever into the EU? It is a statement uh, that is, as far as we can look into the future, will be uh, the rea reality because of the British uh, debates and uh, the, kind of the history uh, of moving into the, uh, into the European Union, I think this will, this will be the perspective that the British people see. So I think it is not worthwhile to, to, to think about the question whether in 50 or 100 years the British people will see it different. It is a question of today that we have a common perspective within the European Union. A uh, general question. Um, in face of Britain threatening to, to exit or to leave the EU, the crisis in Syria, wars in Africa, the refugee crisis that is currently going on, um, all these horrible things that are happening, what would you tell a young student um, who is starting to maybe lose their faith in politics, who's starting to be a little sad or depressed or resting <coughs> towards, towards uh, policy? Looking at the crisis in, uh, in Syria and Iraq, and looking at all the war that is uh, going on there, I think it's absolutely necessary that we understand that the answers to this could be only European answers. No one, no single country in Europe is able to manage the developments of the Near East as they were, we were able in former times. So it's uh, necessary for us to understand this. I think that the conflict we see there is, uh, is a very big one. It, it uh, reminds me from the development of the so-called 30 years war in Germany, which was in the medieval times, which did took place in the medieval time. There were foreign armies on the, in the country. There is private armies acting that, like the uh, Daesh, and uh, and so it is not very easy to see that in a very short distance we will have a solution. But we have to do a lot for getting a better outcome. And so I'm very much in favor of all the activities to, to get the Syrian parties of the conflict together uh, on one table or around uh, one table and uh, to get all the international parties involved go to this table, like Russia, like the United States, and the European Union, and then that. And so I think this is what we have to do. On the other, cent on the other hand, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that Europe has a responsibility for the refugees. And my point of view, it is a European responsibility. It is not a German one, because it is anyhow our Set out there is anyhow a necessity for us to solve the problem. And uh, we thought very much about the dangers that might come to the Balkan, the Western Balkan, if no solution could be found, which is a European one, and that this is now a Greek problem. It doesn't make the things better. But uh, looking back to the Balkan, when I became member of parliament, and in the, in the end of the 90s, it, I, I was very much afraid that not the first thing I would do as a newly elected member of parliament wouldn't be uh, to elect the new, the successful Chancellor Schroeder to be 
to have a government, but to to to, to raise my hand to, to stop the, the war against Serbia at that time, which I hadn't. It, it didn't come to me to, to, to do this task because the, 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 the parliaments before came together once once again to take this decision because the Clinton couldn't wait for the new uh, parliament uh, to come together. But if this wouldn't have happened, it was, would have been the first decision for me as a parliamentary uh, that I would have to do. And uh, so I'm always thinking about the dangers which are in there. And it's a big task for, for all of us to get a more peaceful development of the Western Balkans. But we are also responsible for Greece. And we are also re responsible for all the refugees in Turkey and Jordania and Lebanon. And no one could say it is your problem, it is our problem, and we have to find common solutions. Well, so they are very different. So, so you laid out several crucial tasks or sort of action items, but are you optimistic and confident? There's going to be a solution anytime soon? Yes, because I'm 58. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this means that uh, I'm not thinking that uh, the ideal way of making politics is that anyone has the same, is thinking the same things. I, thi I, I understand that there's a lot of, uh, of, of, of uh, difficulties and, uh, and debates and, uh, and very difficult situations like we have them now. But this is how politics are. It's not a problem. It's uh, a way to solve problems. Um, first question, second, and then third. But you can go first with Can I just get back to the debate on like, the wealthy state? You were explaining that the solution might be that just people who are in full time employment get access to benefits in a different EU country. I'm just wondering what that means for people who are either just in part-time work or who perform unpaid care work, like many women. So is basically an EU citizen just premised on the male breadwinner model? Like, what would that entail for large parts of the rest of the population? We are just speaking about the first year after you entered uh, a new country within the <coughs> European Union. And it's obvious that the solution that would be uh, that uh, Buying a ticket for a train from Porto to Düsseldorf couldn't give you the right to get the social welfare benefits of uh, Germany. So you have to find a solution how you enter, in, enter into a system of social welfare uh, support for the rest of your life. This is the consequence. And I think that uh, the right way would be to do it uh, if that we say after you are successful in another country and you earn the minimum wage, which is not a very big uh, thing but to you're do. Saying full -time employment as well. Yeah, but this is how counting the thing. If you earn one thousand four hundred seventy euros in one hour, you would be fine. But uh, this is not the case for the most people. So I think if we want to have something you could understand, it is this way, and. Uh, it's absolutely necessary, necessary that the people do not move to another country to be dependent on social benefits and, and the things like that. So my idea is, after moving to the other country, you have to be successful in the labor market, not too much. The minimum wage is not very many. It's, it's not a big income. It's uh, something which gives you the opportunity to survive and uh, to do it by yourself. And for all the others, for instance, if someone is went, went to university and uh, lives in the country, or if he is born in the country as a foreigner, he would have no problem to, to get all the uh, benefits from the social welfare state that is uh, open to anyone living in this country. But the, 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 the central model should be that not just Entering the country is the reason for getting a, to getting access to a, a new social welfare system. Otherwise, it couldn't be handled. To give you an idea, 1,470 euros, which is uh, the minimum wage for a single person working full time, is in some countries of the European Union a sort of a middle class income. 
And if you understand that we pay to a family <coughs> with two children something which is uh, quite more than, uh, than uh, which is more than this, this, this money, I, 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 this 1,400 euros, you could understand that it couldn't function, that just moving from one place to the other is the reason for the, the access. It must be, there must be some other reasons. The most important would be labor. The second one is you were at the universities and got, 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 uh, got skills, or you were born there and you lived with your family, you were at the schools and things like that. This is what we already have. But we need a central system which is the, gives the direction that we can afford to have 28 different ways of social welfare in, Germ in Europe. Otherwise, we, we would have the necess necessity to have a, a, a system which is the same, more or less, in all the countries. And this could not work because of Germany. It could not work because of Sweden, of Denmark, of the Netherlands, or of the United Kingdom, all these countries where you have a more or less good social welfare system, because then anyone would try to think to get uh, some support from there, just moving the place where they live. And this couldn't work. Um, I had a question actually related to the refugee crisis again. Mm. Um, are you, as mayor of Hamburg, and therefore a very big city in Germany, are you angry with Britain, um, considering their intake of refugees compared to the German intake? Or are you rather angry with German politics? <laughs> I'm not angry with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> or frustrated. Or <laughs> or I'm not frustrated. I'm, I think that it's necessary that we start, that, that we are in a debate. And it's absolutely f okay that we are. We are discussing the different uh, questions. So the, the British people more or less discuss the question of U EU migrants, which is not the case of the refugees. There is a debate about refugees as well, but this is not the main topic in the public <coughs> debate today which is different in, in Germany, where we are in this moment discussing, are discussing more or less about uh, the refugee question any day. Um, to give you an idea, in my city of Hamburg, I think 30 to 40 percent of the population has a migrant background, counting from 1950. If we would start earlier, it would be even more. But uh, this, the, the, the authorities decided that we should start with the statistics in 1950 because otherwise all the refugees after the Second World War would be counted in the system and this would give a good uh, understanding, uh, produce a good understanding about the real situation. In the classes in Hamburg, uh, in the, when the pupils attend school the first time, it is half of the pupils that are um, of, uh, of, a, of a migrant background. Not in any place in Hamburg, but uh, if you look at all of them and, uh, and count them, you will find this. This is not a problem. Uh, the biggest problem is that 1.1 million refugees in one year in Germany is also a big problem for a country as rich as Germany. And uh, having having the necessity to find places for 40,000 40, people, as we did in the last three years, is um, something which is not very easy. We made it in the end, but it, it is something. And if the things won't change, this will mean that in this year we will have to find 40,000 other places just in the city of Hamburg, which is something. So I, I guess that it's necessary that we find a common solution for the problem in Europe. And I have to underline the, um, I, I, I understand the Chancellor is absolutely right when she says this is a European problem. It's not a German one because we were ready to do our task, but we need some others doing it also. And if we wouldn't be, would if Europe and the international community would have supported the refugees in, in Jordania, Lebanon, and uh, and uh, and Turkey on at an earlier stage, we wouldn't have a problem like we have today. And what's your long-term solution to that? To the migration intake problem? Okay. Can we solve it in Europe alone, or 
I think that we have a that it's always necessary to have an international strategy that makes pro possible that there are not that much refugees as we count them today. But as anyone knows, this is not too easy, and it's a, it's it's something where the foreign policy needs a lot of strategies and where we will where where we will face problems like the one we face today. Uh, in the next decades, I'm absolutely sure about this, though it is very sad. And the second is that we need a common uh, responsibility in the European Union about that question, more or less. And this is the debate we are starting, because not anyone is used to a question like this, because they don't have the experience of the refugees uh, to this extent of, uh, of, of the, to this uh, extent as we have it today. And uh, this is why I'm not so angry, because I think uh, we are at the starting point of a debate about the European strategy towards refugees coming to our continent. In the last row, is a question. Um, coming back to the migration report, um, first to clarify, you have to recite six months of journey before you can claim benefits, so it's not only by and train And um, with all due respect, it sounds a bit like cherry picking take um, the taxpayers from other countries which are more skilled and leaving them with the benefit claimers. So it leads to more asymmetry within the European Union, which proved to be so detrimental in the last um, half decade, right? And leading to more migration and the consequence. And um, I think you also um, kind of missed the point to develop institutions um, that are that cope with this new development of a single market, which migration essentially includes as um, um, creating long life um, education and things like that. I disagree on the on on, on, on the on I disagree uh, to, to to your point. Uh, first, yes, there is a European rule that. Uh, States have the right to deny any access to social welfare for six months, for instance, and the European Court had some uh, sentences where he, he said it once again that uh, this is a, a possible right. And this will help us to find a solution. I'm absolutely sure I'm, I'm fine with this uh, decision of the European Court. But the question is if you find there's two solutions, and if you look at the, one of the ideas of the social court in Germany, they say the following, and this is their answer agreeing with you. The German government should expel the people who have not enough, uh, don't earn enough money. If they don't do so, it's their problem. And if you look at the European regulations, it's absolutely clear that if someone is staying in your country for six months and then uh, asking for for some social welfare support, you have the right to send him back like the Beatles. And uh, I think this is a cynical solution, because instead of saying that you have the possibility to try to find a work in another country, and if you are successful, you move for the rest of your life into the social welfare system of this European country, you develop a regulation that means that the ones who are asking for social welfare in within the first six months or the first year should be expelled to their home country. And I think this is not a good solution. It's more or less cynical. And it would uh, afford that we find regulations which makes it possible for us to manage a situation like this. And this is not a good solution for a, a uh, common labor market in the European Union to make this absolutely clear. I am in favor of the free movement of labor in Germany, uh, in Europe, and I think it's absolutely necessary that we have that with 500 mi million people having the right to choose the place where they want to work in Europe. And I'm absolutely sure that this can work without too big problems. But we have to think about the problems coming from the fact that we have 28 different systems of social welfare, which is not the situation, for instance, in the United States. And the answer is not, as someone might think on the first hand, 
to have a common social welfare system because this would mean that in some parts of Europe we have to reduce the social welfare st structures we have and I, I'm not supporting this idea. I am supporting the idea of making the things feasible, that they are fitting together. And this is what we have to think about, not more. Hello, I'm Eva Brunner. I work for the German, Swiss, and Austrian group of the Conservative Party here in London. And um, of course, we are supporting the mayor election. And interestingly, both um, the current mayor, Boris Johnson, as well as the Conservative mayor candidate, Zach Goldsmith, have declared publicly that they will vote for leave. And um, how much weight will you think, as a mayor yourself, um, put this one? In the, in the referendum because, I mean, London is one of the cities which is mostly pro-European. And if the mayor says he will vote for leave, how much will the influence be in this debate? So I'm, I'm a German politician. <laughs> And that means that I'm not, I don't want to intervene too much into the uh, debate in the United Kingdom about what is the right thing to do. This, this is a question that British should decide themselves. I'm absolutely sure, absolutely sure if uh, Mr. Johnson would follow the perspective to remain the mayor of London for the next 10 years, he wouldn't have made this decision. <laughs> <laughs> so he would, in this case, be in line with the people of London. And um, I invited, as you may know, the British Prime Minister to, to Hamburg. And uh, he and um, the Chancellor uh, spoke at this so-called Matthias Mahl, which we have, which is the oldest uh, dinner in the world. <laughs> we have it since uh, the 14th century. And, um, and we always invite uh, friends from outside. And this, in this case, it was David Cameron. And it was really very, it was very good to hear him and uh, the chancellor supporting the same idea. And I was very happy that I could give some room for them to find uh, a way to discuss about the problems that should be solved on the European Council. And they were successful, as we now know, with compromise was found. And um, I hope that um, the people, the British people, will vote for remaining in the in the European Union. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. I, I just oh. watched the same. It's easier <laughs> to look at you. Um, so you were mentioning uh, in a very brief comment, though, uh, the need for a European solu solution to the refugee uh, crisis. Um, I would like to ask you, what does that mean in concrete terms regarding Germany's foreign policy? Are we going to see, for instance, an intervention in Libya with German participation? Or anything along these lines? <laughs> I think that um, it's necessary to have a common activity and to discuss about that. The debate in Germany is different as the debate uh, here. And, but you know that uh, there is now a common activity towards Syria. And uh, so far there is no debate about new activities in Libya. And uh, I hope that the developments in the country will make it possible that there, will is, that there is a chance for re-establishing a sta stable state which is able to, to run the country. And uh, this is what we should support today. This morning, I had a breakfast with a number of uh, British journalists in which I explained the German position. And I have to be very careful here, of course. I don't think that the Brits wake up in the morning asking themselves, what do the, the Germans think? <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, I think I can make it very clear, as I said in my short speech, 
that there is a common interest. And of course, I know it's a, it's a choice between the heart and the head. <coughs> and I'm just uh, calling on the Brits and the British journalists who then write uh, pieces that will be read by, uh, by, the, by, the, by the, the general public that the keep your head. That's my message. <laughs> One more question, maybe to both of you, you uh, about about the the Brexit and like like the UK leadership here uh, regarding the Brexit. So like you had uh, David Cameron like after the, the EU um, summit like uh, standing in front of the journalists saying yeah the UK do doesn't have any love uh, for for Europe. I don't have any love for Europe. Do you not think sometimes like it's it would be time for I don't know, for somebody in the UK standing up there, showing some leadership and telling people, look, this is actually, these are the benefits and the advantages we have uh, because we are in, in the European Union. Um, because I think this is one of the things that's clearly not done here in, in the UK, or not done like at a sufficient level. What do you think is, like, should, should there be some more leadership showing, showing some more, not, <coughs> not maybe not love, but like some more showing the advantages of, of the European Union? Well, if you follow the po political statements of the Prime Minister over the last weeks, you find that there has been a clear shift in his strategy. And he's been, after the Brussels summit, he's been very clear that, he, that he's taking sides. He's, sa he's saying Britain should <coughs> remain in the EU. And he's fighting uh, for it. And I think he probably knows best what kind of arguments will uh, uh, mesh with the British uh, psyche and uh, I think he will be much better understood than anybody of us outsiders would be understood. But uh, the way he, he does it, uh, I think is quite impressive and he's a seasoned campaigner. So I, I think we will see more of that in the, in, in the next months and from that side I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident. I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the British government uh, and, and the Prime Minister will, will do their best and will be as efficient as they can be to win over the British heart. Nothing guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, being a politician, I'm, I would be very careful. I'm, I'm very careful about giving the suggestions for British politicians what they should what they should do. But uh, I can tell you what I recommend the German politicians. They should argue in questions of Europe out of the perspective of Europe. Uh, they, it, it is not a good idea to, to, to as, as a German member of, of parliament, as a German secretary of uh, state or of a member of the cabinet or as a German uh, prime minister somewhere in the country, just to speak about war, Europe, what you could get from it. We should think about solutions that are good from the European perspective and then we have to look what that will mean to Germany and if it fits together. But the other way around, we wouldn't be able to find uh, common solutions for 28 states. So we have to discuss the question not just out of the perspective of our nation state, but also of the European nations together. And if we are acting in this line, I think we are more successful. I think we have three last questions. We'll start from the back um, I think that Chancellor Merkel's um, efforts to keep Schengen going and to accommodate the internal UK debate are very impressive. But this, um, she's doing it in the face of massive opposition from CSU, her finance minister, the members of the press, and so on. But I wonder, is it distracting her from a more important trend? I'm thinking about opinion moving in places like France and also to some extent elsewhere, Italy and Spain. And one of the drivers yeah, of the view that uh, France is less keen now on the EU is the trade deficit, of which they are um, obsessed about. The UK's deficit is greater, but don't worry about it. Um, so, and one of the things, one of the problems there is the huge trade deficit that Germany runs. It was running a deficit over 4%, which was the max allowed under or Eurozone rules. They got it changed to a 6% limit and are now running a deficit over, a surplus over 
A different so, surplus. <laughs> yes, that's right. Surplus, German surplus. I, I, is it not if, if, if uh, UK leaves, that's an issue. If France leaves, that's it. I mean, uh, should Germany not be trying to accommodate that issue? France put forward proposals, which, using your US analogy, is effectively a, a fiscal transfer um, sort of linked to the scale of the excess surplus. Should Germany not be seriously thinking about that? I'm always wondering, discussing about this question, what should be the outcome of thinking? Because it, uh, it just would make sense if we have anything to do that could change the situation. And um, I do not agree with those at the universities, for instance, who have ideas how you could manage to change the situation of the one country having an export surplus, the other one having the, the opposite, the one having a budget. There is something in the politics you can do, uh, a surplus in the budgets, or the other way. Because it depends on so many things that are uh, the result of a globalized market. And it is not the EU European Union that changes the situation to the worse. It is the world development that is causing our problems and the different of opportunities of countries. For instance, the German word Mittelstand is now translated to many countries as a German word. Anyone understands that it is something special that we have a lot of countries, companies with 500 employees, 1,000 employees, 2,000 employees who are part of the world market and successful together with three, four or five other companies in the world. And uh, no government in a single state can just produce a situation like this, just uh, doing the right things from one morning. You have to do something which is the right thing for decades. And in many cases, it, cases it does not follow the line of politics. It's an, an outcome of economic developments and historical traditions and things related to that. So I think it's absolutely necessary that we understand that in the globalized world, the idea of influencing uh, the development of, uh, of GDP, the influencing, influencing uh, surplus and deficits and, and, and trade is much di more difficult than it had been when uh, Mr. Keynes wrote his book. Keynes wrote his books. And it doesn't depend whether you're left wing or right wing or something in between. It is more difficult. And it is not just making decisions by politicians. It's something different, which has to do with many difficult questions that have to be solved. And one of the opportunities of the German economy, which has impacts on the tax situation, which has impacts on the budget situation, is, for instance, that uh, we don't have a lot of uh, unskilled labor in the country anymore, which will be a big question in the refugee uh, question, because if many of them are not very skilled labor, and the unskilled labor is in Vietnam, the former German unskilled labor, or is it China? or is in Romania, or in Poland. It's very difficult to, to, to find a solution for those now coming to Germany and looking for labor which is not anymore in the country. <coughs> to, to, it's, 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 not anymore, it's not easy to find in the country anymore. And if you look, for instance, at the harbor of Hamburg, one of the three biggest ports of, of, of Europe, and you understand that there is uh, nearly 10 million containers which is uh, handled each year, you could see what globalization means, and that it's not very easy just to find a good solution for a parliament to take a decision, and afterwards the things are running different. And my idea about the France economy, for instance, is that they intervened for a long time to save unskilled labor in their country. And you can do it if you are quite successful for 10, 20, or 30 years, but one day you will, be, will not be able to fight against the world and against globalization and the outcomes of that. And this is different in Germany because we did not do this too much. And we have some luck because we are producing what is needed, machines for 
for, for fabrication in countries where there is a lot of low paid labor and uh, very extremely expensive consumer goods. Some people call them cars. But uh, <laughs> so this is what, what is the, the luck of the of, of this days. This might change after a very uh, in ten years or twenty, so we always have to fight about what will be the next task to be solved. And uh, so I think it's not a question of budget deficits, of taxes, and of, uh, of of economic strategies in single countries, because it is the out, it is the, the consequences of globalization, and that no one will be successful on on a market just looking at his country. I think we have one last question. Yeah. Um, yes, hello, my name is Philip. I studied migration here at the LSE. My question is to both you, Mr. Scholz and Mr. Um, um, my question was in view of the mere fact that there is a referendum, and in view of the reimposed border controls in Europe, and also in view of the um, rise of nationalistic pop and populist politics in Europe, do you think we have reached a maximum of Europeanization? Do you think that the migration crisis is like a crucible or a test that has shown that Europe has reached its peak, or do you think that there is hope for more Europe? To my point of view, there is there's hope for more Europe. And if we understand the refugee crisis, the refugee question right, we understand that there is a lack of common activities concerning the refugee question. It is not the, the opposite. And it's obvious that if we want to have a defeat free movement of labor, if we want to uh, want to, if we are willing not to re-establish the borders between the states within the European Union, we have to find a common strategy concerning the borders we have together. And similar to the question of uh, budget strategies, and uh, and and state that similar to the question of banking. It is the case here that we don't have a really successful common strategy concerning our borders, the common borders of the European Union. And I think we need something like that to be successful. A border is a border, and it's not easily to go from one side to the other. You may go there as a tourist, as someone who is, uh, is uh, active in business or, or someone who is uh, just going for, for, for uni to universities and to, to study something. But you also may enter a state moving across a border just being a refugee. But if this is the case, you need a common European strategy. Now we are discussing about hotspots, a very uh, bad name for something which is very clear to understand. It's a place at the border but we ask those coming in whether they are refugees or not, sending those back who are not, who don't look like refugees, but just having other reasons for coming into the European Union, and those who have an opportunity to be accepted as asylum seekers in the European Union. But if you have organized this system with the hotspots, you need a system where other, afterwards 28 states are taking their responsibility in this question. This is what we are now discussing about. It's not too easy. It will take quite a lot of time. And it will have a consequence that many of these refugees are looking for Germany, for instance, because they heard it's a good ch that they will have good chances for this country afterwards. They never heard about the problems of unskilled workers in an established eco economy like Germany, but they are, they, they are coming. And so we have to find a common solution. And especially Germany must be very, very pro-European in this case, because we don't have any, uh, have no border uh, to another state which is not the e an EU, EU state. If we would follow this line, no refugee would make it, could make it to Germany just by, by coming by, sh by ship to Hamburg or coming, which is very seldom, to be honest, or um, or coming uh, with a night plane, and this is the both possibilities they have. So Germany must take responsibility for refugees attending at the shores of uh, Spain, at the shores of Malta, of Italy, and uh, Greece. But this means not Germany alone. We need a common strategy. 
and part of this strategy must be that Germany takes a responsibility which is bigger as just looking at the fact that no refugee could come to Germany without crossing another European state. So this is the discussion we have to start now. It would have been better if we would have stayed to start a debate like this five years ago when the problem was more an Italian one or a Spanish one or something like this, then anyone would understand us better today. But now we are starting, and uh, this is what we have to do. The second is um, the success of right-wing movements, or populist, right populist movements in, in different European states couldn't be understood or couldn't be understood always as the same. So to be very honest, which is the most astonishing fact, that there is some successful right populist parties in some countries for some decades now, which do not have really problems. Because what is the problem with the Netherlands? To, to build up a right populist movement, this is one of the most <coughs> richest countries of the world. The same with Austria, the same with Denmark, the same with Norway, which is not European Union, but also Europe. The same now with Sweden and Finland. And we don't know how the outcome will be in Germany. But <coughs> it is something which has to be understood. And it's not very easy to understand it in these countries, because there is not, real, not really a problem. There is not uh, people who, are, who must be afraid about their future. But possibly it is the outcome of economic success and uh, the idea that if you are in a good shape like this, you might be in danger of losing something. So it's, it's a very difficult question to discuss. And it's not very easy, because it is not obvious why things like this happen. There's other right movements who are more, um, who have different reasons for, for their development, I think. It is not the same what we see in France as in these other states are counted. But this is something very special to, to, to look at and to understand. In the end, I hope we are starting a, a common debate. And even the United States had in the 50s and 60s of this century, of the last century, debates about what is the common goal, what do they mean in the different states of the, of the, of the United States. And uh, we will have debates like this in the next uh, 50 years. If it goes well, if it goes well, this is my point of view. Thank you very much for sharing your insights on welfare states and freedom of movement in Europe, to both of you. Um, thank you very much for all your questions. Um, thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for oh, joining us and for this year.